Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Your Freedom Hub's Cash Patient and Free Market Doctor. I'm your host, Jeff Cantor, along with my co-host, Charles Froman. We're sponsored by the Freedom Hub, which is, in fact, a disruptor's intersection. We are here because we're worried about our health and obviously what it's going to take to make that successful. And there's, you know, the cost of dealing with health care and, and there's problems. And so we're trying to emphasize that here, but to take it to another level, because in truth, you can sort of take this middle person out and put any number of names on it. This is what it actually looks like as far as like part of the reimbursement system. This is for benefits for services for low income individuals. So there's 80 plus programs at a trillion dollars a year in spending. So this is what's going on behind our backs and, and before our very eyes in some ways. And then of course, information or misinformation or whatever, how do you cut through all that chatter? So it's a mess. We just wanna also emphasize, we have a show that's in the same vein, but it's about all the rest of your liberties and freedoms and the like. And that's on Friday, I'm sorry, on Wednesdays at four. And then definitely want to check out the health solution, which is at patientempowerment.mpb.health, which is kind of the backbone of what we're doing here. And then on that note, let's take a quick gander at the site before we get into tonight's guest. So if you come to your-mp.com, you'll see there's an awful lot on here. And we're here for the webinar series, which is on this drop down here. But before that, if you do the continuing the conversation is many times more important because after you've heard a great speaker, you want to engage with that person and here's your way to do it. We, we feature every speaker after the fact and the ways to work with them or learn from them or donate to what they're doing, whatever it may be. It's an excellent, excellent resource. And the other thing is then if you also hover over the freedom tabs is fighting for freedom also critical because here we've got issues to be aware of and then all the organizations which we keep adding to of all the ones fighting for the freedom of all of us in many different fronts so you'd be aware of all of that so let's kind of get steered into today so on the webinar tab here when you hit it you come over here and you'll see there's a little intro at the beginning and then a breakout of who's speaking so we'll come back to this in a minute but just to keep going who's coming up so you can see the future guests and then also the links so you can see the videos. So every weekend, the video for today will be posted by then, and it'll be available on all four of these platforms, whichever is your favorite one. That's the one. Let's just take a look for a moment at this one on Brighton, and you'll see it goes back a long time. Ergo, the continuing the conversation, because you're going to see some great people and talks here, and you're definitely going to want to connect on some of these people. So we really appreciate you taking a look at some of the older stuff on there. Sadly, a lot of it could be a year old, and it feels like it's still going on right this second today. So some of the stuff, unfortunately, is a little bit ageless. But on that note, let's find out what we're up against tonight. And here is Charles to take the reins. Indeed, Jeff, and welcome, Dr. Fisher. Um, this is um, a great topic uh, for the cash market that Jeff and I were featured in Forbes magazine for helping to create uh, for families and small businesses that want to save money and regain their choices. Every week for three years now, we featured leaders in advocacy and entrepreneurship in the health field. And this isn't our first dental presentation. We had another biocompatible dentist, maybe up to two years ago now, Jeff, uh, Jerry Curatola, uh, who is also a member of our, our health share uh, community. And people are starting to get it, that dentists aren't all the same. And their reason for upgrading to the biocompatible dentist stems in part from their concern about toxins in their fillings. And Dr. Fisher did present on this almost a couple of decades ago to Congress. We're speaking about mercury amalgam uh, for the fillings for your cavities. But it goes much further than just giving you less toxic fillings. It's also about something very interesting about the mouth that people learn when they get into natural care. And that is uh, the meridian points that connect each tooth to different parts of your body and that really the mouth is connected to your whole body health. It's not just about fixing problematic teeth. 
And Dr. Fisher has an association that aims to educate people about this upgraded market, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. Um, I myself have experienced this market for decades now. I have seen only biocompatible dentists uh, in up in D.C. with Nathan Berger and now closer to Richmond, uh, Dr. Evans. They're mostly cash uh, taking dentists, not much reimbursement in dentistry, but that keeps the market clean. People know what the prices are in advance. The competition is fierce. And so with that, Jeff, we have our intro. Very good. Okay, on that note, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let you take Gail over there, doctor. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate your inviting me to be on with you today. I, uh, I think my introduction to um, biocompatible dentistry, as you're calling it, or holistic or biological dentistry, uh, really goes back to the late 70s. Um, I was, after graduating from Georgetown Dental School, which was not a biologically oriented uh, dental school, but it was a good, good training. And so when I finished there, I started teaching there. And one of the perks of teaching at the dental school was that you could take any of the continuing education courses uh, that they sponsored uh, at no charge. And my annual pay as teaching part-time one day a week or half a day a week actually was $500 a year, which in Georgetown, that's, that's good because it was, you got free parking. So that alone was worth, worth the, the price of entry. But uh, when I was taking courses there, I took courses on pretty much anything that was of interest to me. And one of the, I had the opportunity to meet a gentleman by the name of Dr. Harold Gelb, who was the, probably the top, not probably, the top TMJ, jaw joint, headache, neck ache, earache, dentist, in the United States, probably in the world. And uh, when I met Harold, he opened up a whole new world to me. Uh, he talked about uh, acupuncture. He talked about homeopathy. He talked about clinical nutrition, uh, cranial osteopathic treatments, uh, chiropractic, all these things that I never heard anything about going through, you know, the four years of dental school or the four years of pre-dental. And uh, so I started following Harold around the country, went up to New York where his practice was and spent days with him watching what he did, seeing how he did it. And uh, he could get people out of pain um, like no one else I could see. I mean, I've seen chiropractors, osteopaths, orthopedic surgeons, ENT docs and so forth, but he learned all of those things. And I realized I had to learn all those things to learn how to take care of the patients that I was seeing. So it really set me on a whole learning curve for many years. Uh, so it, over the last uh, almost 50 years now, I've taken over 5,000 hours of a continuing education over different areas of uh, health. And, um, but he's the one that opened up the whole world to me. So I, Harold is now retired. He's in Florida, 95 years of age. His son is still a dear friend, still runs the clinic. His, and Michael's daughter is in the practice with them. So they've got three generations now uh, doing what they do. And uh, so he continues to inspire me to do these things that we've learned how to do. And a couple of things I learned from Dr. Gelb was a couple of the pearls. One is, he, and to give you a background, I went to his office one day and he had five new patients which is not unusual. I get five new patients in a day a lot of times, but one was from California, one was from Germany, one was from uh, South America, one was a local kid from New York, and I forget where the fifth one was from. But I mean, that was a normal day. They flew in from all over the world to see him. And he taught me a couple of things. One is that if you listen to a patient long enough, they'll not only tell you what's wrong with them, but they'll tell you how to fix it. And that was brilliant at that time. And uh, so we, we listened to patients. And um, the other thing he said is that when you get really good at something, you can never get arrogant or complacent because the better you get at treating a certain type of problem, the tougher are the patients that are gonna come to see you for it. 
so that you have to keep learning. And so he inspired me to go on a learning trip, which I still I still take a lot of courses every year. Um, so that's kind of my introduction to biological dentistry. And uh, so it started, one of the things we were treating people for TMJ problems, headaches, chronic neck, back pain, things like this. And um, what happened was that at the same time, I was taking care of patients that needed to get their mercury fillings out. This is back in late 70s, early 80s. And I thought that if I'm going to take, patients were coming in and they had both problems. They wanted their mercury fillings out and they had TMJ problems. And so I thought as a pragmatic approach, if we make an appliance that would fit to orthopedically help correct the jaw posture, and we're going to take the fillings out. If we made the appliance first and then took the fillings out, the appliance isn't going to fit so well over the new fillings. It's going to fit differently. So we decided it would make sense if we're going to do both, let's take out the fillings first, and then we can take care of the TMJ problem. And what I've learned, and I, another buddy of mine out in uh, Chicago that I was in communication with back at that time, he found the same thing that when you took out the mercury fillings that the TMJ problems for the most part went away. Um, and I think the toxicity of the mercury was creating a lot of problems, probably reducing thyroid function, which creates more pain and all these sorts of things. So you start putting all this stuff together. And my, my mantra and my philosophy in dentistry is always to do the least amount of dentistry possible. And, uh, and that's always been the way I've approached patient so we see a lot of patients that will come in and they they say you know i've just been told i need thirty thousand dollars worth of work and we look in there and say you know probably do a few fillings and maybe a crown or two and that's really about all you need um, so we we uh, I, I pride myself on doing minimum dentistry i'm a minimalist in my approach we've always felt that way about pharmaceuticals the least Pharmaceuticals you can get by with the better. That's what got me into homeopathic medicine, acupuncture, and so forth. So that's kind of my my story in, in dentistry over the past forty some years. Why don't you give a little rundown for a lot of people that don't even really understand what is biological dentistry? I mean, you've sort of been skirting around a little yeah. bit. I mean, biological dentistry, some people call it holistic or alternative, but biological dentistry means treating patients with procedures and with materials that are non-toxic, that are health supporting rather than health depriving. And um, so we, for example, one of the things we've been doing for the last 35 years or so is something called the Clifford Materials Test. It's a blood test that can screen patients for immune reactivities to about 18,000 different dental restorative materials, fillings, crowns, dentures, braces, implants. Anything a dentist can put in your mouth is something that your body was not born with. It's not a natural occurring substance. So anything we use as a restorative material, to fix a tooth or replace a tooth, or whatever, uh, has the potential of causing an immune reaction. And, and sometimes they're adverse, and sometimes they're not. But so being able to be able to predict ahead of time whether a, a material, for example, is going to be creating like an allergic kind of reaction, if these are more delayed re allerg allergic reactions, is very helpful for the patients. Uh, the, those that have concerns about if they have a, a woman, let's say when they wear earrings, they get reactions to the metal. That's usually a nickel uh, reactivity. But it's nice to be able to test people ahead of time if they want to and spend a few hundred bucks to do that uh, in order to uh, find out what materials their body tolerates. We don't demand it, it's always an option, but it's something that's been available. And we've, we found it very helpful for patients, especially who have these, you have these, a lot of these patients that are allergic to planet Earth seems and uh, you know that if you're going to put things in your mouth without testing they may run into a problem so if we can avoid it it's all the better but that's kind of what biological dentistry is using procedures that are going to we want to remove 
infection from the mouth. We want to uh, get healthy tissues, healthy structure. So when we make like TMJ appliances to help posture the lower jaw and the skull, that can get rid of neck aches, it can get rid of back aches, it can get rid of a lot of symptoms that you wouldn't necessarily think of related to your teeth. We've also learned, of course, over the last couple of decades about people who have infections in the jaw, infections in their gums, are much more prone to certain cardiovascular problems, certain types of cancers, blood sugar problems like diabetes and so forth. So there are a lot of things that dentists can do to mess your mouth up and mess your health up. But on the same token, there are a lot of things we can do that can really help remediate a lot of the health problems that a lot of times the medical doctors may have challenges with if they don't have the help of a, a biological dentistry to support the patient. I, I can relate to what you're describing because having been to one of your compatriots, they ran that test and figured out there was something I was sensitive to. So they had to use a different filling material because of the results of that test. And he was telling me an interesting story because they did the same test on a different patient and figured out that she had an allergy to a certain stuff. Well, lo and behold, she'd had multiple hip replacements and everyone had that in it. And when she figured that out, she went and had another hip replacement to a product that did not have that in it and all of her other issues went away. So there you go. And here, even the doctors, and this is at the Cleveland Clinic, didn't even know about doing such a test to see if this hip would interfere with her body. And yet the dentist figured it out. So there's a testament to the power of the biological dentist. Charles, I see your hands up there. It is. Um, <clears throat> and we may want to invite someone in the chat to uh, discuss a question they have. Sure. Uh, after me, uh, several questions that I can ask one at a time or just one now and come back later, Jeff, if you, if you want. Tell us about the uh, association, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and, Te and Toxicology. Is that a site people can go to to find uh, someone like you? Uh, yeah, there's uh, the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology. The website is www.iaomt. That's the I'll have it up there and I'll put it in the credits. And it's dot org. Right. And you can go to that website. We have about a thousand members now, I think, um, around the world and uh, maybe a little more. And they grade them. You, you can, when you become a member of the Academy, a lot of uh, there, we have certain levels of achievement. Uh, the first one is accreditation. Accredited means and when I refer patients to dentists around the country, I, I go to the website if I don't know somebody off the top of my head, and I look for someone who's at least accredited. Accredited means that they've been a member for a couple of years, been to a couple of meetings, and they've taken an oral test, a written test, and to show that they know how to take out herpy filling safely, they know how to you know, take care of the patient, how to give them proper informed consent, and do the clinical stuff properly. Um, beyond that, there's another step called fellowship, which requires more training, more uh, education, and so forth. And then finally, there's mastership, uh, which is like the, the top. So in the past couple of years, they've introduced another preliminary thing called SMART, which I actually caution patients to go into patients that just have the smart because that's that's kind of a thing that they put together i think it's not something i agreed with i disagreed with it pretty vehemently but it's something that dentists when they come new into the academy they pay a, a fee annual fee and the, the academy will send the patients so it's kind of pay to play i don't like it i'm not smart certified i've gone through all the the three uh, accreditation fellowship and mastership but so when you go to that site, be careful if it's just someone that's smart. It doesn't mean much of anything. But it's a good site, and we have chapters, you know, throughout Europe and uh, Asia and so forth. So it's a good. The uh, we've been I've been on the board for twenty, well, thirty years at least now, and um, I do all the. Uh, we have two meetings a year of scientific conferences that we invite speakers. In all health disciplines, very few dentists that I have invite to speak, but I invite all the speakers and the medical doctors, PhD researchers, some dentists. Um, and I've been doing that for the last 65 or 66 meetings. And our, our 
our next meeting will be in Seattle. Uh, and Scott Tips, the, the head of the National Health Federation, is going to speak again. I've had him speak a few times. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a great organization. Very good. I was going to say, uh, Mark's got some questions. He's been popped yeah. in the chat. You want to kind of put them out there verbally, Mark? Are you there? You can unmute yourself. He says he's driving. We might have some issues there. Oh, driving. Okay, well, then let me throw them out there for you then. Uh, he's got two questions, but I'll give them to you one at a time. My dentist wants to take x-rays every six months, but I only let her do it once a year. What's your recommendation on when to take x-rays? Well, it, my, my approach is we, it will depend to some degree on the patient's history, how often they get cavities, how other problems that may have that are ongoing. But I would say typically we take uh, bite wing x-rays about once a year, sometimes every other year, uh, which are the ones that is usually one or two on either side to check for cavities between the back teeth because you can't see in there usually. Uh, the panoramic x-ray, which shows the jawbone, the jaw joint, sinuses, uh, looks for bone pathology, you know, infections in the jaw, things like this. Typically, we do that about every three years. Okay. And then the other one is I had four mercury fillings taken out. Within a month, I developed a lipoma in my neck that had to be surgically removed. The dentist insisted that the removal did not cause lipoma of those fillings, in other words. What were your thoughts on that? Could they be related or is it coincidental? Uh, you know, I've not seen that happen. I've been taking mercury fillings out for 40-some years. I've never run into that. Uh, I'm not sure what the physiological basis of that would be, but you know, when you take out mercury fillings, the important thing is to properly protect the patient as well as the dentist and the staff. You know, dentists have twice the mercury body burden than their average patient does because we're occupationally exposed. Um, and uh, so mercury goes into every part of the body. Uh, and so it can create all sorts of mischief, but that's not one I've seen. I wouldn't rule it out, but I, I think it's likely not cause and effect, but who knows. One thing I can also relate, because when you're talking about it, when I had that process done, they, you know, they had me covered, they had the room shut down, they had like all these ventilation systems running. It was just really almost like a bubble boy situation that when they were gonna take those fillings out just to protect themselves, me and everybody else. Yeah, the first time I, I presented to Congress, you know, I was invited to testify, was on the, uh, the, uh, the amount of murky vapor that people absorb from dentistry compared mm. to vaccines, compared to diet and so forth. And if you go to my website, you can see what I did. That was the 2002 testimony. Then in 2000, I think it was 2004, I did another one regarding how the FDA has sort of mismanaged or not adequately protected the public by documenting and classifying mercury films properly. And then the third one was the, uh, the third time was 2006, I think. Um, I was invited back to testify on the environmental impact of mercury from dental offices. So it, it, it affects a lot of different things. Mercury is a bad player and there's no good use for it in the human body. And uh, we've been trying for many years to get dentistry to step up and limit the use of it, get rid of it. Um, it's gradually declined in use, but it's not gotten rid of it. Really. When I was gotten a couple of years ago, I was at an FDA hearing and uh, I was interviewed by uh, someone from the Washington Post at the end of the hearing. And I made the simple comment, it was truthful, it said that, you know, the, the end of the, the, the conclusion of the FDA hearing, which they had written prior to the starting meeting, uh, said that, well, you know, there's no problem with mercury fillings. And so my reply to the Washington Post reporters that, you know, it doesn't make sense. You, you, you're taking something that as a dentist, the 
if I have scrap of amalgam left over, let's say I'm still putting mercury fillings or in, I'm taking them out and I have some scrap pieces of that filling, I have to send it to a environmental, someplace that has, you know, dispose of hazardous waste. That same hazardous waste I put in the mouth was not a problem, uh, is what they're telling us. So I just said, you know, it didn't make sense. And so a, a dentist somewhere here in Virginia apparently complained to the board and I got, had to hire an attorney to kind of, they said I was practicing, but no, I was advertising, false advertising. It wasn't an advertising, it was a, a, a news article. But anyway, those are the kind of things we ran into back then. It's, it's become a lot less hostile to, uh, dentists that think outside the box uh, these days, but uh, but you know mercury is, is a problem. And it can cause all sorts of mischief because it goes to, into every organ in the body, and it doesn't do any good anywhere that it goes. Yeah, in that respect, for sure, Charles. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Fisher. You know that was, of course, an issue with the vaccines too, and uh, I think mercury's remains in the flu shot, um, but it has been removed in many other shots, but it has not been removed from some of the manufacturing process. So I guess people not seeing dentists in your association could potentially still be getting fillings with mercury in them. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Uh, I mean, I think when I, when I stopped using mercury fillings back in uh, 1982, um, it was a few years later, Gordon Christensen, who's a very well-respected uh, dentist who tests materials and so forth, put a news, put a, uh, he did a survey of dentists that were getting his newsletter. And I think 90, the first one he did, I think 98% of the dentists were, were still using uh, mercury. That was a few years after we had, we had stopped. Um, some years later, I think now, the last I heard, it's probably about 50%, might be a little less now, hopefully, but a lot of dentists are still using it. Um, and a lot of them have just gotten away from mercury just because, you know, selling black fillings and white teeth done with it, you know, so cosmetically, um, there's been a, you know, demand of patients to get tooth colored fillings, uh, which generally speaking are much better, but even some of them can be uh, very immunologically unsuitable, depending on, you know, if you look at the Clipper test. But in any event, um, you, at least you're not getting mercury in the white fillings. There may be other stuff in there that may not be ideal for you. But, um, but besides the cosmetic part, we know that the mercury exposure, when you're taking out the old mercury fillings, or, or putting it, the mercury is still putting it in, creates an aerosol. It creates a um, particulate matter that the patients swallow that the, uh, the the assistants to the dentist and this, most most assistants are, are female and female dental assistants who uh, work in dental offices have a much higher rate of sponta spontaneous abortion birth defects blah blah due to the mercury exposure so it's mercury is a big one. fluoride's another big one you know uh, root canals periodontal infections. All of these things are uh, things that the dental degree can help uh, that often manifest as medical problems, not dental problems. And that's why we are very um, happy in our area that we have medical doctors and other healthcare practitioners that understand the relationship of the teeth, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the tooth, the acupuncture meridians that the teeth relate to what organs they innervate um, and how the mouth, you know, relates to the health of the rest of the body. It's all, it's all, it's all connected. Why is there such a reticence on the dentist to get rid of the mercury at this stage of the game? Are some just too old and then in their career that, you know, that's can't teach an old dog new tricks or, or what's the problem? Yeah, I think I remember when I stopped using Mercury. I, I got out of dental school. I started practicing in 74. And in 82 is when I quit and out of my practice. Um, and, you know, the guy that 
got me to do that was a guy named uh, Hal Huggins. And I heard Hal, I met Hal in 82. And he said, and he went through the same thing that we all go through. He said, you know, you've been doing this for years, a lot of times. You put these things, you're, you think you're doing the best you can for the patient. And you find out that, that this stuff is, can be harming. And uh, so you get this, uh, you know, come to Jesus moment and say, you know, well, I've been doing this for eight years in my, my experience. I was putting this stuff in for eight years, but I don't have to do it anymore. I can stop today and, and make it right. Uh, but I think part of the challenge for dentists is to confront the idea that they've been hurting people, that they've been trying to help. And some of them just can't, can't, I guess, accept that. It's a, it's a tough one, and morally and emotionally to get through. But as Hal said, you don't have to do it anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, I can appreciate when you started, it might still be kind of way out in left field, but it's become much more of a known thing. So you would think yeah. at this point they would suddenly say, Oh, I, you know, I did, I mean, just innocent. I didn't know that's how everybody did it. That's how I was trained. And, but, you know, times have changed, new information. I'll just suddenly change. Right. And, and instead, you know, even if you didn't go backwards and try to take the mercury feelings of the people you did do, you just stopped moving forward. Right. So it just seems very weird. And then they themselves have kids and stuff. So are, are they going to let their kids have mercury feelings too, therefore, knowing what they know potentially? Because do you think a lot of them just don't even know? Yeah. I mean, is that a lot of just ignorance? Yeah. And it doesn't disseminate enough within the medical or dental community that it kind of gets out in the newsletter or somehow, somewhere they're going to hear about it anecdotally. It's that well shielded from view. Well, put it this way. I, don't, I forget how many dentists are on the country. There are 100,000 100, or something like that, I think, in the U.S. or North America. And we have a thousand members of the IAMT. Now, there are a couple of other organizations that have similar uh, they're smaller organizations. There's the International Academy of uh, Biological Medicine and Dentistry, and then you have the Holistic Dental Association. Both of them, you know, have similar um, philosophies and so forth. The IAOMT is the only one, though, over the last 30 years has constantly sponsored research at major institutions throughout North America. Um, and look, because when we started doing this, we knew that mercury was poisonous. But we didn't know, back in 1982, we didn't know how much people absorbed, how much, how much of the mercury did the dentist absorb, how much did the patients absorb from the process. We just knew it was bad. And uh, so we started funding research to find out the answers to all those questions. And uh, so we know a lot now. Uh, there are still people that are ignorant. Uh, and, you know, you have to understand that a lot of dentists, just like in medicine, a lot of medical doctors, they read journals that maybe help them hone their skills on certain mechanical procedures. Uh, let's say they're root canal specialists, they want to learn how to do root canals better. Um, if they're cardiologists, they may want to know how to you know, open up a, a blood vessel in the heart better. Um, and a lot of just like a lot of dentists may not know about mercury and the effects of it, uh, like a lot of cardiologists don't know the benefit of coenzyme Q10 and their cardiovascular health effects. They know the mechanical stuff. And that's what they, their journals that they read maybe focus on. There's a lot of stuff in dentistry that we, we can't know at all. Um, and certain people, you know, they have a certain focus. I have, my focus is pretty broad. Um, because it transcends dentistry and medicine. You know, it goes into cranial osteopathic medicine, chiropractic, structural, functional medicine, uh, acupuncture, and all those things. So, I mean, it all, I understand there's a big world out there that we can't master everything, but you can know what you want to be able to do yourself and know other practitioners that can do the things that you may not, you may know about, but maybe not masterfully and you can send them to those people. Is there any sort of industry pushback? I mean, does the industry have a vested interest in the mercury? I would think they would, could do fair better by promoting these newer materials that might make them more monies and, and the like. 
Yeah, I don't know a lot about it. I know that years ago, when we first started having these conversations, that the American Dental Association actually owned patents on amalgam. I don't know that they still do, but that seemed like a, a not a good conflict of interest that they were shielding. Um, but you know, dental manufacturers it would seem to me that they could make more money on these other products, which I think they do. I would think. So I don't know if it's you know I'm not involved with that part of the just just uh, just factor. trying to get your take on it. Yeah, I don't know. It, Mark it's, Mark's got another good question for a couple here. Um, his is that um, how can you verify that the dentist got 100% of the mercury out? And then um, when you were commenting before, what's better to do than a root canal? Right. Okay. Uh, I mean, to see if you've got all the mercury filling out, the dentist can see in there, and it's pretty easy to see gray or black filling in a white tooth. Uh, to be able to tell after the fact, you can usually see on an x ray if there's still metal in the tooth. Uh, I've had situations where myself, I have, you know, I've taken a filling out and I thought I got it all and see an x ray later on. I say, with my best of respect, um, it was a real deep one, and it, or sometimes real, real close to the nerve. And I'll say to the patient, look, if I go out and get that last little bit out, maybe into the nerve, you may wind up with a root canal. If it were my tooth, I'd prefer to leave that little speck in there than to possibly uh, run that risk. Sure enough. So there, there are those things, but you can tell usually by visually looking if you're the dentist doing it or with an x-ray after the fact if they're the next dentist or the patient telling to see it. But as far as the root canal question, it's a question that I get almost every day. Um, I would say that when you have a dead tooth, a root canal is done usually because a tooth, the nerve of the tooth dies. And when it dies, it gets infected. So when you have an infected root of the tooth, uh, a couple of things happen. One is you get anaerobic bacteria growing inside of a dead tooth. Uh, when you do the root canal, you get rid of 90, maybe 98% of that anaerobic bacteria. Anaerobic bacteria, instead of giving off carbon dioxide and water like we do when we respire, when we breathe, they give off, instead of H2O, they give off HS. They use sulfur instead of oxygen. And so HS is hydrogen sulfide. That's what makes a, a rotten egg smell bad. And uh, if you've ever smelled it, it'll smell real bad. If you ever smelled a root canal tooth, when you open up that, it's it smells worse than that. There are some really nasty chemicals that are the byproducts of that anaerobic bacterial metabolism. So you clean it out, you can disinfect it, but you can't sterilize the inside of a dead tooth. So a root canal tooth is much better than a tooth that is infected that hasn't had a root canal. So I'm all for root canals if that's the best that the patient can get done. Uh, it's better than leaving the infection wide open. Uh, but a lot of the, some People will, and we have a lot of patients that don't want the root canal. They, they understand that anytime you have a root canal, I believe there is a potential for a health liability there. Uh, it may aggravate other health issues, and that may relate to the acupuncture meridian that that tooth is on, or maybe manifest elsewhere in the body. Uh, and some of that can be from the chemistry that I talked about. Some of it can be, you know, every tooth is wired to, a, and I use the word wired the actual sense, but they're all related to energetic pathways of electron flow in the body, which is what the acupuncture meridians are, we believe. So when you when you block uh, an energy pathway, it's like flipping a, um, a switch. Uh, you have this acupuncture meridian that's allowing electrons to go through the body that help the body stay energized and if you you block that acupuncture with a uh, acupuncture pathway with a root canal tooth or scar, or scar, then you can block that energy flow or at least inhibit it to some degree. So there are subtle and there are chemical things that root canals can affect adversely within the body. And uh, so the options when you have a basically you have a tooth that's infected inside. 
the two options are either to do root canal therapy to minimize the infection but not get rid of it, you can reduce it dramatically, or to remove the tooth completely. And then if you remove it completely, then you know there are options as far as replacing it goes. But but that's the difference. I mean, a lot of people uh, believe that you should just take all root canal teeth out. I think the reality of it is that depending on what acupuncture meridian that tooth might lie on, depending on the vitality and the overall health of that individual, their age, um, uh, some people do, do fine with root canals, at least uh, on, on a symptomatic basis. And other people will suffer from that. And uh, you don't always know ahead of time exactly. There's no good test that would be accepted by science these days to know ahead of time how a patient's gonna do with a root canal. You just have to use your clinical judgment and then let the patient decide. And a lot of times they just decide on a gut. You know, people sometimes know what's best for themselves. So I don't try to push them one way or the other. Uh, we try to let them know what the options are, give them some background. Uh, I have a good friend who's a cardiologist who actually then became a lawyer and who then retired from law and, uh, well, no, he's still practicing some, but he became an expert on root canals, wrote a book on it, uh, Tom Levy. And so I asked a few years ago, Tom, could you write up a little informed consent? I stopped doing root canals 35 years ago, at least, because uh, I realized they were problems and I just didn't want to do them. Uh, but we refer people to endodontists, which are people that are, that's all they do is root canals are really good at it. Um, but they don't know what I know as far as the acupuncture we're doing and all that. So we give these patients a, like a little two page thing that Tom wrote up and uh, it explains to, from the research, published research, what the cardiovascular risks are uh, for people who've had root canal treated teeth. And, uh, and so they know that there's a, potential downside, we give them to the, give them that before they go to the endodontist. I gave my endodontist what I'm giving to the patients. I, I said, this is what we're gonna tell them, so just be prepared. Um, and that's all, I think the best way to take care of a patient is just to give them informed consent or, or informed denial of a treatment. Just let them know what, what you know and let them make the choice People, I think people usually, if you give them information, they, they make the right decision. Typically, that's true. Charles, I see you've got your hand up there. Just Dr. Fisher, as others wanted to hear more from you on a certain topic. Um, you know, I, I, like a lot of folks, have an esoteric uh, hobby. I teach Kundalini Yoga, so I'm, I like the uh, whole meridian and chakra business. What kind of trends, patterns have you seen from your teeth examinations with meridian blockages? And therefore, you know, what connections have you seen to which organs? Is it a lot of liver or overtoxification that you're finding? Um, and if you find some patterns with the meridian connection to the whatever bodily system you're seeing symptoms from, do you have some therapies that you add? And what are some of those? If that question makes sense. I think so. I mean, one of the common things you see, um, and I learned this from Dr. Vol years ago, who taught electroacupuncture, according to Vol, that the wisdom teeth relate to the small intestine and the heart. Okay, and a lot of people get their wisdom teeth extracted, and a lot of times that those sites do not heal properly, and that can cause, we believe, or aggravate uh, cardiovascular problems. Tom Levy writes about this in his books. Um, so that's one of the common things you see that people who have had wisdom teeth out and where the, the site did not heal properly and they get a, what's called a cavitation. Some people call them eco neuralgia inducing uh, cavitational osteoporosis. But it's basically like an osteo, uh, it's like a, a chronic infection or a dead part of the bone. And it can, influence or block the energy flow in the, in the heart and small intestine meridian. Uh, the front teeth relate more to kidneys and bladder. The, 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 the 
molars and the bicuspids relate to the, the uh, stomach, large intestine. Uh, so the different teeth, depending on where the, uh, the teeth are located, uh, that's going to influence what uh, acupuncture meridian and uh, so forth that you might be tinkering with. Uh, I think you go and find these tooth meridian charts online. Uh, some of them are a little easier to read than others. Uh, we have posted in each of our treatment rooms, so that's a quick re reference. And it'll tell you not only what acupuncture meridian, but what that meridian, what organs that meridian innervates, what what uh, uh, spinal segments that the chiropractor might look for issues there, uh, what endocrine meridians, and so on and so forth. So everything is connected. Why do you suppose that the tooth is connected to organs? It's just not like just a thing in your jaw. Well, because it's a living organ. It has, you know, it has a blood supply, it has a nervous supply, it has lymphatic drainage, just like every organ in the body does. And uh, developmentally, they all are developing at the same time in utero. So it's, it's just the way that it's part of the uh, divine design. Very interesting for sure. I think Charles might have a follow-up. Um, sure. Uh, you know, these, everyone has their favorite dentist questions that you get over and over again. Um, basic maintenance, um, brush teeth with what kind of toothpaste, oil pulling, flossing, water pick. Yeah. Toothbrush, flossing, oil pulling, water pick. What would you, what would you recommend? I think all of the above are very good. Uh, I I personally brush and I floss and I water pick every day. I do I do not oil pull, although I urge people who like to do that to continue doing it. Um, oil pulling the way I learned it, it takes about twenty five minutes. Um, irrigating with a water pick takes me about three, probably three minutes. So in the mornings before I head to the office, I water pick, I brush, and I floss. Um, if you've got the time and you like doing oil pulling, have at it. I think I think it can do a lot of good too. Um, flossing uh, can get between the teeth. If I what I recommend and what I do, I brush and then I floss and then I do the water pick. With the water pick, I use a little herbal and essential oil solution made by the dental herb company i don't have any interest in the company but a good friend of mine started that company years ago bernie sheckard was a member of iomt he was a dentist he's retired now but he was also a master herbalist and there are other products out there and i'm sure that are very good too but it the essential oils can help reduce the inflammation in the in the gums that you know the inflammation is where the bleeding and the, uh, the soreness and the redness come from um, and that's very soothing. So if once you get the stuff off of there with the brush and the floss, then going in there with a water pick gently can just remove, you'll be surprised what you get coming on out of there, out of your mouth after your brush and floss and you do the water pick. Uh, so I think they're all good. Um, I have nothing bad to say about any of those things. Particular uh, toothpaste or anything better than another in that regard? There are a couple that we like. We have three in our office. We have some people that want a whitening toothpaste, and we have one that we use. It's uh, an AP24 as the brand name of that. Um, the two more holistically biological-oriented ones are made by the Dental Herb Company, um, and it's called, uh, well, it's called, um, I think it's just called Dental Herb Company Toothpaste. Um, and it has uh, those same kind of herbs that I use through the water pick. Um, and then there's another one that Jerry Caratola, who you mentioned earlier today, came up with called Revitin or Revitin, R-E-V-I-T-I-N. It's, um, it's an interesting, the Revitin is what's called a prebiotic toothpaste. So it has the things in there that the, the healthy bacteria need to live in your mouth. So it's promoting the healthy bacteria. People who have infections in the mouth, I think I tend to promote more the, the dental herb company because the essential oils and the herbs can help combat if they have a lot of pathological uh, bacteria in the mouth. And we can look at that 
sometimes you can go by smell or by the looks in the mouth. Uh, but we also use a phase contrast microscope in my office, have for 35 plus years. So we can take a little smear of the plaque from the teeth, put on the microscope, and get an idea of whether you've got a healthy microflora in the mouth or a microbiome, or whether you got a, a nasty one. That, so with the nasty ones, the sick ones, I like to use something that'll knock back the bacteria that are pathogenic and then go in there maybe later with the prebiotic. Some people like the taste of one versus the other. I think they're both good. Um, but those are the three that we, we promote and uh, recommend and have in our office for patients. One of the questions that came in through the chat was, we talked about your teeth quite a bit. What about the tongue? Right, right. How well, does that fit into the whole hygiene scope of what you do? It, or that yeah. what we should be doing as the patient? Yeah, I, I'm, I honestly, I do not, use the tongue scraper, a lot of uh, people do, and I think it's a good thing to do. Uh, I just find it distasteful myself to do it, but uh, I don't discourage people from that. Um, when, you, when you keep the mouth healthy, I think the tongue follows through. A lot of the things that you see on the tongue are coming from elsewhere in the body. In other words, you see discoloration, you see coating on the tongue. That's not always necessary from what's happening in the mouth and maybe what's happening so keeping the gut healthy is obviously really important because the mouth is part of that continuum, you know, from the mouth to the other end of the, the tube, it all is connected. So starting keeping the mouth healthy is really important, but a lot of the stuff that we're, we see in medicine and uh, health in general that can be problematic for people begins in the gut. Well, sadly you are what you eat, so there you go. Starts right there. It's interesting how old school wisdom is still current because people figured out a lot of things about the body a long time ago. We just got better tools these days and some better insights, like you said. But you knew mercury was bad before you sort of knew why, like you said. People knew things inherently about it a lot. Like you said, if I give the patient enough information, they typically can make a good choice. And that's how humans typically function. But I got to say, this was very enlightening today. So I really appreciate you taking the time with us today. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's been a pleasure being on with you guys. I appreciate it.